So, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, this is like a monthly session whereby we will share computational beam examples from be, uh, from practice as well as from the research point of view. So, we are very happy to have with us today um, two groups. So, one is uh, um, Yipeng from Nian Poly. So, he's a student at Nian Poly, second year student in the School of Design and Environment. And he's going to share with you an example of a digital design as well as fabrication with a built product. And then we, will, we are also very happy to have uh, Dr. Chu, uh, Chu Tianxiang. So he's a lecturer at Singapore Poly. He's an expert at um, solar energy, renewable sources. And he will also be presenting uh, regarding digital fabrication. Okay, so without further ado, we will let uh, our student, uh, Yu Peng, share with you an example of what he has learned using computational beam and also what they have built within a short span of, I think, three to four weeks from design to uh, final fabrication and completion. Okay, Yi Peng. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, can you hear me all right? Can, can, can. Okay, you also can see my, my screen, right? Yes, I see the welcome. Ah, okay, then I'll just start. Uh. Yes. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Peng, and I am representing on behalf of my entire group uh, to present this, uh, to present our installation. So, what makes a, a design student? So, we actually realized that as design students for a year, we actually look upon our seniors with quantifiable examples. Uh. We look at their 4.0 GPA works at a gallery uh, in our school. So reference for our projects. Then we also look at the design, the DE Instagram, celebrating their academic achievements and dreams of our seniors. So enrolling in our school in a pandemic era and not trans just transitioning to an endemic era, we realize that we have never actually really experienced authentic polytechnic life. So we can't help but wonder what the fun, <laughs> genuine, and memorable moments that our seniors have went through. So it transcends beyond final submissions trauma. So it's the time where we eat out together, we fool around in our classrooms, or have sleepovers or study trips that we have together. So we call our installation our DE life. It is a tribute for us, made by us, made for the future to come, and for the future to see and be inspired by. So this is our how might our challenge statement. So how might we create an interactive structure that encourages students to linger around the area? So yeah, our chosen site is outside the gallery. So this is our proposed installation. So constructed in a wave-like formation, right? So to break and break traditional walking paths is intended to be like a picture gallery that also entices students to linger around that area. Our D life is parametrically constructed in, is a parametrically constructed installation made from approximately 270 modules and 1,500 acrylic connectors. So a module is con con constitutes four laminate panels. So that's at least 1,100 laminates used. So as you can see, the connectors are connecting the four laminates. This is the like an elevation of how our structure will look like. Uh, here is just a video of our building process. In addition to the coding strategies that I've already described, a misting system, which provides a fine spray of mist water and provides further cooling to the space and controls the humidity is required. The design and configuration of the misting system is to meet a minimum of 80 to 85% saturation. Oh, this, this sound is from where? So it's not from you, right? Oh, no. oh okay. Design was carried out by a UK company, JD Ultrasonics, 
comprises the air and water lances. And, and this is just the video of our, us building our installation. Okay. And pictures. Yeah. That's all. Oh, okay. Thank you. So uh, just to summarize um, what Yipeng has presented. So this is like a short project. Uh, as I mentioned, it was a workshop whereby we shared with the lecturers, uh, Mr. Raja and Mr. Song, who were the leads for this particular project at Nian Poly. Um, we shared uh, the program, Rhino, with Grasshopper to design parametrically a screen that he has shown to you. So what the students have learned was that they, they, they use general parametric design principles to come up with uh, iterations among their groups. And then each of the groups will present their final design. This is the one of the chosen design in which all of the students voted to build. And you could see that uh, we were very happy that we have a lot of laminate samples. So this is a very sustainable uh, installation, so to say, because we are reusing um, laminate samples from the uh, supplier, Lamitech, and they were very kind to give us all of this um, disuse, so discontinued um, series of laminates. So what the students did was that they used computational design principles to come up with iterations until they are happy. And then with the development of their little module, which was also part of um, Mr. Raja's class for AMT, they designed this small little square uh, rectangle um, that they laser cut. So this allows them a lot of flexibility to configure these particular modules to achieve the final result. And so far, so good. It has been standing at their um, DE center, even though there's very strong wind because of the mere nature of the structure is porous. And I think maybe, Ipon, can you share with them one shot whereby you all have put your photos inside of these screens? which makes it even more meaningful other than the digital fabrication part, because it, it also captures all the memories that you all have uh, within the school itself. Yipeng, there's a photo right somewhere. And let me, let me find. Oh, okay. Yeah, all slides. I think I saw some over there. So it was also interesting because they, 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 they managed to create this little small detail where they clip their Polaroid photos. And as the wind blows, that, that thing is also engaging. So it's not like a static structure. The, the photo, the Polaroids will move with the wind. Okay, so um, yeah, if we can't find it, that's good. So. This concludes the presentation by uh, our very good Nian Poly student, Mr. Ipeng. So we will now move on to Dr. Chu, uh, who will share with us his work at okay, Singapore Poly. Me, thanks, uh, Aloysius. Give me a second and let me share my slides. Uh, are you able to see? Yes. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll start. Thanks, Aloysius. Yes. Um, okay, today's topic uh, is going to be a short one. I'm go going to only show you two projects that I did with students in Singapore Poly. So I'm a senior lecturer from the School of Architecture and the Built Environment. Um, I'm currently teaching the year three students who are in the diploma in architecture. Okay, so the first project actually happened uh, before COVID um, in 2019. Um, so we we did this eight meter long uh, parametric bench um, in September and October. So there were there there was some planning prior to that. Uh, setting doing the parametric model, preparing, doing some prototyping uh, before we uh, go into full scale manufacturing of this. So today I'm just going to talk about. Uh, this project and uh, the process of which we were involved in. So um, you could see I'm, I'm sitting here on my right is actually 
uh, one of my colleagues uh, with me and the rest are all students. So uh, for me as an educator, I think it's fun uh, working with students on these type of projects. Um, but today is a bit different. I, I want to tackle something about scale and associated details. So the parametric bench that you, you saw in the previous photo was actually done one is to one scale. But what's interesting and what got me thinking is um, um, Burhan, the colleague that was sitting on my right, he got so excited about the build work, he decided to do a scale model. Um, and then when, when we start to sit down and think about it, actually it's very interesting because when you do your models in school, you don't really realize what goes into building something one is to one. Um, and that's very important. I mean, I'm talking about huge objects and maybe buildings. Of course, furniture has a different set of um, issues and that you tackle uh, at a furniture level. So as you can see here, the model, which is about one is to five or one is to ten. Can't really remember the scale. So what we did was, of course, we push out the files into into 2D line drawings and then we fed it into the laser cutter and we cut the elements. So it's actually slotted in the base that you see here. But in, in reality, when you build one is to one, it's, it cannot be done that way because of the nature of the material. So how do we then build a one is to one bench? It always starts with ideation. So I always tell my students, don't jump into um, your digital environment so quickly. I think what needs to be done very quickly and with broad strokes is um, with sketching. Um, although it may seem rough and raw, but it embodies some of the intent and the purity of the idea that you have. So this was an initial sketch that I was trying to think about. How do I create uh, multiple waves on a bench such that um, it takes on different postures uh, when one sits on it? Um, so what happened is we, we did the parametric model and based on the site constraints and how we could um, actually design this bench, we realized we have about 201 panels, all uniquely cut. Um, I think if you were to use your own CAD software, drawing individually and trying to create a very smooth surface is close to impossible. I think Aloysius, and his students will know, will know this. So the easiest way is, of course, to use a parametric tool, create the, the geometry first, and then use a, an, a, a standard tool inside called contouring. And that's how we did it, very quickly slicing the individual layers. But of course, then when you think about building it at one is to one, um, we had to decide what is the thickness of plywood that we're working with. So we actually use a 25 mm for cutter ply. And then we also uh, had to watch what is the spacing in between the plywoods because aesthetically it affects how uh, one sits on it. If the gap is too big, then the, the smoothness of this bench together with all the different contour lines um, will not be uh, obvious or refined. So the, the spacing that we kept was actually um, 18 mm. But that only resolved some of the problems. So how are you going to connect all the 201 pieces together. So of course, through the use of parametric modeling tool, in this case is Rhino and Grasshopper, we are able to then control um, where the steel treaded rods are being treaded because if you look at the section, everyone is different. And if you were to say from the first panel to the last panel, the rod doesn't run through all the panels. So how do you control that? So in the parametric model, what we did was we created uh, virtually the rods and where it's positioned. So we could control where needs to be supported and where uh, need not be supported. So then together with the outline of the contour lines and the positions of the treaded rod, it gets fed into, it gets translated of course, into CAD drawings, which we could then feed into our CNC machine. So we have one CNC machine um, in our fat lab. Um, it's a simple two and a half axis, but uh, just suitable for what we need to do because we only need to cut. Uh, the cutter just need to move in the 2D plane, which is the X and Y axis. So of course, um, we had a team of dedicated students. This, of course, was not done as one of my elective modules. It's actually done uh, during the vacation, the six-week vacation that we have. 
um, and we kind of rostered everyone um, and they, they would come down at the allocated time to help us um, cut uh, with the CNC machine and of course you you need to then um, post process or finish it off before the assembly. So we, we had kind of, uh, it allows us to get to know each other better, me and the students and also um, also having a bit of fun because the workshop was quite far from our school where we're going to assemble it. So we had we had to take the like the uh, ring road that is uh, around our school and then push it in trolleys on different batches to to get to our school. But hopefully in the future uh, we don't need to do that anymore because we're looking to actually work with an external party and have some CNC machining closer to our school. Um, this is just pictures of the process. You could see stacks and stacks. Um, the nice thing is that um, with design to manufacture processes through the use of computational design tools is that every unique piece is could be tagged. But of course, what's really strange is the CNC machine in order to speed up the process of cutting, we didn't engrave the number of the panels on it in sequential order. What we did is um, Anyway, the operator needs to to be around. So what he, what he does is actually he will label every panel based on the um, the drawings for manufacturing uh, on his computer and label uh, every one of them. Then of course there's the usual working work, uh, which is to varnish it and protect the surface uh, of the plywood uh, from from pests, of course. So these are some of the joinery that we don't really think about. So when we first embark on it, um, it was something very new to us. This is the first time we're doing it. Uh, one of the questions we ask is how do we make it, um, how do we de develop a process for the assembly such that each piece is manageable by two or three students? Because each piece, when we estimated, the largest piece, when you fully assemble it, is about 100 plus kg. Um, and that's not trivial and we have about 15 of these different parts. So when you add it all up together, it's about a ton, um, which is quite scary if you think about uh, the weight of it. But how do you break it down so that it's manageable for assembly? The other thing is how do you uh, have treader rods connected sequentially? What are the details and how do you keep them in tension? So uh, on the fly, actually, um, together with my colleague Berhan, um, we kind of troubleshoot and develop some solutions and we tested it. I think that's that's the thing with digital fabrication is also there's a process that uh, not many people talk about, which is prototyping. So actually, this is the finished product, but before that, there was there was a uh, series of prototypes that we made uh, just to understand uh, even the seat height, did we get it correctly? And then we went in to edit the parametric model and we came out and then we try it again. And then when it works, then we went to full production. So I'm just going to share this video of the final assembly process. I hope you enjoyed this. It was kind of fun. Let me try and go to the next slide. OK, the, the second and last project I'm going to talk about very quickly before we break into some discussion is a segmented plywood shell. Um, this is done in collaboration with an architect, Pani Cheng, uh, from Produce Workshop. Um, of course, he's also a co-founder of Type Zero Architects and Superstructure. So I'm just going to, uh, it's actually at the drop off at our school at block W5A in SP, but um, our school is not exactly open for guests yet, so just have to make do with the video, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Aloysius, you'll be able to see it because you're an adjunct teaching yeah, in our I, school. I've I seen it. Yeah. Uh, it was there since last year, right? I, uh, it's very uh, yes. I just yeah. talked to Chris about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just going to, this material was actually done after we built the um, the pavilion. 
Mm -hmm. So we, we were trying to rationalize. Actually, this, this was all thought about, but not formally shown as diagrams. So one of the things when we had, when we set out to design something like that, uh, we were looking at something called shell structures. Uh, shell structures are basically structures where its own self weight and load um, is, is carried as stresses within its own membrane. So in itself is actually a very efficient structure. Um, so, I mean, if you look at shell structures by Candela or uh, Eisler, you realize that the concrete is super thin compared to the kind of floor saps that we see in typical building. And that's that's because um, the nature of the uh, structural physics of it is the stresses are all within the skin and it's to do with how the geometry is set up. So, I mean, from left to right, um, the different type of shell structures that um, you the typical ones are really monoclastic, which is um, the curvature is in one direction, synclastic where you have double curvatures, but in the same direction, and anticlastic opposing uh, curvatures. So how does that stack up in terms of the structural properties of uh, shell structure? So we, we kind of ran it through Caramba 3D, which is a finite element method uh, analysis tool that is plugged into Grasshopper. So we ran some simulations and if, if you look at the pink shade, the darker it is means the the um, the relative um, displacement. That means when when you have a shell, it's under its own load and it will deflect downwards. So um, the white part means it has zero deflection naturally, because if you look at the monoclastic, the, su the support is actually the two edge that is on the floor. But the one that is um, in pink uh, shows how it will, will kind of deflect in. Um, and then, of course, the synclastic and anticlastic. Um, you could, doing this simulation actually allows you to understand a bit more of how the structure will behave in the physical world uh, instead of running real tests. And that gives a certain sense of assurance that what you build will not collapse. Um, so the top row came from the previous slides on the analysis, but the the cool thing about the tool that we're using is it allow us to visualize how it actually displaces and you could see and for exaggerated case for the three different types of shell. Um, the, the displacement is inwards and some it actually is like a three dimensional wave. Um, so how then do you uh, circumvent the issue? Um, and how much displacement is actually happening. Um, so if you were to look at the legends, it gives you the range of displacement that happens on the different shades of pink, uh, which is very interesting uh, to look at in detail, but I, I won't kind of go into that now. Um, so of course we went through a few iterations um, and I'm just showing you the final model that we achieved. And you could see there's less pink area, but there there are still some. But that doesn't mean if it's pink, um, it's, it's not good. It's just telling you that's the highest level of displacement you, you're going to get. And because it's in CM, um, the darkest area you're looking at about 0.9 mm displacement, which is minimal really. Uh, which means this structure is pretty strong and is done with uh, 9 mm plywood. The other thing we did was um, fabricating shell structures in timber is, is challenging because the surface in itself, the cells that you see, um, in this case, we, we impose a hexagrid onto the shell structure. Uh, each panel, each hexagonal panel, um, it's not planar. So if it's not planar, the the way you need to fabricate it is you either CNC mill something with a five axis machine for all the individual panels, which is really uh, time prohibitive and also cost prohibitive. It's going to be very expensive uh, to run a five axis milling machine. Um, basically, a five axis machine is uh, there's a cutting head that not only moves in the X, Y, and Z axis, is able to rotate uh, to have um, to have access to different cutting angles. So for for a curved surface, if you want to realize that, you need to uh, use a three x uh, a five axis 
uh, CNC milling machine. But of course, for us, we only have a three axis. So the challenge for us is to think about how then do, do we fabricate with just a basic CNC. So then the natural thing is to then penalize it. So if you were to look at the red line, we ran it through uh, a solver, uh, which is Kangaroo 2, which is also a plugin. It's a pseudo physics uh, plugin that plugs in with Grasshopper. So what we did was uh, the solver solves, it takes the vertices of all the individual panels and we, on this surface alone, um, excluding the uh, 20 panels on both sides as stabilizers, the main shell itself have about 160 panels. So um, manually, it would not be possible to try and force all 160 panels to be planar. So the solver in itself, using its own embedded algorithm, adjusted the points until all panels were planar, which is flat in the XY plane. Uh, and um, we can actually output that as 2D drawings, uh, and then it gets fed into the CNC machine. Um, on the left is our my colleague Lucas, and on the right is Walter. Um, so basically, you have to prepare the drawing. So we also use uh, a plugin called OpenNest, and we nested. Nest, nesting means to take the panels and to compact it within uh, the plywood material that you have, which is 1.2 by 2.4. Um, how do you reduce the wastage of the material that you're not using, but how do you pack as many uh, panels into that area so that you uh, maximize or you reduce the number of plywood that you need uh, to make the the shell. So of course, um, basic CNC means you have to do a lot of stuff uh, by hand after it gets cut. You need to use a vacuum cleaner, which you see on the right, suck up all the wood dust, and then there are something called packs in, in the gap that holds the panel together so that it doesn't pop out during the cutting process and you need to use a chisel to chisel it off. After which, um, we kind of need to tag it correctly and then setting it out, setting out the two edges carefully before we can build the shell. Uh, what's interesting is we thought about two types of assembly techniques. Do we then uh, complete uh, the two ends as a catenary opening, or do we do it from the center? So we took it from the center because um, when you think about it, if you were to construct the the uh, the first few rows at the two ends, and when you when you start assembling towards the center, um, the thing with real assembly is that there is an issue of tolerance. So the the tolerance here, uh, we made it very high because um, we we are suspecting that you know if you make it too precise and it doesn't fit there's there's no gap for us to move the panels around and and we found that out to be true because if if we would have done it with starting from the two ends we would not have completed this pavilion because when we started from the center as we move out even uh, in the other axis, when the panels come together, um, we have to actually move the surfaces around to allow some of the panels to fit in nicely into where it's supposed to be. So for this is a interesting exercise, both for me and the, the students, uh, that building something one is to one um, has little intricacies that normally we don't really uh, take note of. For example, the, the computer builds your your design perfectly, but when it comes out and when you assemble, um, not all panels are, uh, will come together perfectly because uh, wood as an organic material sometimes expand and contract according to the humidity. That's one of them. And of course, that applies to other materials that you work with. Uh, and that ends my presentation. Uh, of the two projects. Uh, I end off with this. This is one of the new projects that we just ended and we're going to embark on similar ones. Um, this is uh, a joint that will be 3D printed. Um, so we actually apply an algorithm called topological optimization where they optimize the geometry such that uh, there's, there's efficient use of the material but still uh, allowing um, the same amount of strength holding the object. 
Um, so that's where we're heading to. So watch this space. If you need anything, you can contact me at this email. Yep. Back to you, Aloysius. Oh, okay. So thank you, Dr. Chu. Um, so now what we will have is we will break. We will have a 15 minute Q&A session. So feel free to post your questions to uh, Dr. Chu or to the student Yipeng about um, which in general today what we have is about digital fabrication. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? If you don't feel comfortable, you can also type in your um, question and I will verbalize it for you. See, we have a good turnout of 40 people. What tools did you use? Oh, so this question uh, you posing to both of them. Okay. Maybe uh, Yipeng, you can start first, which tools you used, and then after that, Dr. Chu will also run through. Uh, we didn't really use much tools. Uh. Most, of, most of the installation is hand, uh, by hand. But we only, for the acrylic pieces, the joints, right, we actually used laser cutter to cut all of it. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Then in terms of software-wise, they used um, Rhino you know, Grasshopper. Yeah, Rhino Grasshopper. Okay. Then for Dr. Chu? Uh, same for us. We use Rhino and Grasshopper, but we use um, whatever plugins that are out there on the uh, Food for Rhino website to, to help us in the designing and also to output the drawings in for fabrication. So for fabrication, we use, I mean, for both projects, we use uh, the CNC milling machine for wood. And then, of course, the normal workshop tools to kind of fit it all together. Yeah. Okay, I'll just type inside the food for Rhino. So uh, that's I have a question, sorry. Um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so uh, familiar with the software part, uh, but for example, uh, for Dr. Chu, the bench or this, right? I see the rods and then the fixings and the detailing. So um, yeah, so how do you get that actually? And also for the for your shell, right? Your panels, I, I noticed you use a butterfly, was it? Uh, butterfly join is it yeah so like did you actually um do you like plan for that virtually or was that like after you had all the panels rationalized already then uh then you thought of it or you know what what what, what was the thought process behind this because yeah i think i think this this tools yeah uh, yeah i understand the whole whole process but like for example your bench your rod you, you said you use 2.5 CM thick, thick panels, right? Like, the, was there, other than aesthetics, was there some kind of like structural kind of uh, sounding or, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the bench, because we knew it was just a bench, um, basically we were, we were kind of thinking what is the safest thickness to use for the plywood. So of course we opted for 25 because it's chunky enough. Uh, I just wonder whether we can push it down to 18, but that will be another exercise. Uh. So we we took a more conservative route. Now, of course, the, the join you have to, we thought through uh, prior to that, uh, how it will actually work. But in the end, you still have the prototype to see whether your idea actually works. So basically, between the different panels, we, we cut out um, uh, plywood circles that are actually acting as spaces at 18 mm. And that uh, maintain the consistent uh, distance between the panels. But of course, it's the, the rod, um, because it comes in different sections, um, there is a connector that we kind of develop in a very crude way, um, such that it connects all the different rods together. And the ends are actually what you saw in the photo just now. It's, it's like holding back the rod and uh, anchoring it to the end panel so that when we connect all segments together, it's kind of like clamped together as one uh, big piece. Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. or was it um, like, do you have already have an idea of like the the end? Because I, yeah, I saw it was a it was like a clamp, like it was a, like a cylinder with like uh, spokes coming out, right? Was it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, 
okay, we conception that design that you saw eventually implemented, it was not something we had at the start. I think with all design, right, you only have a vague idea. Only when you start to implement and and then look at the prototype that you made, then you will go back to the drawing board and ask yourself, um, could this be done better? But of course, within the limitation of the time uh, given to us. So um, the quick answer is no, it, it didn't came out immediately. So when we were building it, it came as a solution through this through the discussion with our students and also with uh, Berhan, my colleague. And then we kind of developed that joint, but that is far from perfect, I think. Um, actually, after building the bench itself, uh, although it's finalized, um, it, it in the end became a lesson for us to, we started asking questions, how could we improve the joinery? Yeah. yeah so correct, correct, it, it, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that yeah, helps. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the rest? Feel free to type in. Okay, um, maybe I will I will chip in with a question for Dr. Chu. So um for the I, I know that SP is also starting off more fabrication facilities, right? Uh, I have heard from Zan, right? So maybe you can share with us about um, the direction that SP is trying to take uh, for fabrication in Singapore and how we would learn to expand this kind of capabilities. Um, okay, I think for us in the Polytechnic, um, we play a different role from the universities. I think they, they tend to look at very um early and innovative and cutting edge ways of uh solving an issue but for us we our aim is really to work with people from the industry and to understand their problems um and we have some interesting companies coming to us uh showing us what they are capable of doing and we kind of uh, told them we want to work with them. Um, one of them, of course, is uh, Pani Chen, who actually was part of the process when we did the uh, segmented plywood shell. Um, so his company actually uh, does uh, very bespoke projects. So for us, we saw that as a signal to upskill our students and they so that they themselves, at least for our poly students, uh, we give them skills that value add to them so that when they are in the industry, not only are they diverse, but um, they can go into these new fields uh, where it's up and coming and it will happen eventually. Um, so what, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to set up firstly a robotic fabrication lab, which is in the process. Um, but uh, the, the process is long, it's not up, I think um i would say is in the span of one to two years we will have one if things go according to plan uh the other thing is we are setting up a collaborative lab with another company but i cannot name them um and it's related to the works that you see um it's a lot of timber cnc uh, milling and also to and not just about machining i think the the, to clear some misconception is not to train our students as machinists, but to train our students for the new digital future uh, in the sense that to develop these bespoke products, you need to have good skills in computational design and also understand the process in which to realize real one is to one projects and what tools to actually use. In this case, they do have to use some machining tools. So it comes hand in hand really. So preparing them for, for the future and how the industry will pivot itself. And, um, and it's not far-fetched because like I said, there are companies out there actually looking and doing it already. So that's what we're doing for our students. I hope that answers your questions. Yes, definitely. And in fact, yeah, it's, it's actually very good uh, that the Singapore Poly students as well as uh, Nian Poly students are having this kind of expertise. So it augments any um, intent that um, companies in Singapore would want for your designs. OK, uh, there is another question now from Mo Hong. Uh, 
is asking for for the first project, what was the criteria for the chosen design option? So, uh, Yipeng, can you let them know about how the groups also uh, came about with the final selection? Yipeng? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there was also actually not much, right? It, we had, we had, you just had to see the the site condition because at the area is actually very windy, and like rainwater actually falls onto the structure. So, um, our original oh, oh first project of Doctor Chu presented. No, I mean Yupeng, since you you are on it already, you might as well talk a bit. Yeah. About it. Ah, and okay. Like, oh, <laughs> like it's just uh from our first design to our final design, right? It's just we had to see the site constraint. Uh. Then we we change our design accordingly to the site. Yeah. So it's essentially the site constraints, like for example, wind or rain plus buildability, because they, they also were given around like uh for fabrication less than one week to to complete the whole thing. And all just by students uh, doing it with laser cutting and then assembling it together. Okay, so on to Dr. Chu for the first project. What's the criteria? Oh, the, cri the, the criteria is actually quite loose. We wanted to um, design a furniture that our students could sit, stretch out their legs. So some parts of the furniture is actually, the seat is quite big. So they could actually sit all the way back, rest, and then stretch out their legs. There's some portions which curve in, but the seat is smaller. That's where uh, some of the students could actually sit around each other and talk. And then, you know, um, the, the end part where it starts to slope, uh, we kind of imagine maybe somebody wants to lie down and just read their book and relax from uh, the daily grind of studio. So that was the basis, um, but of course, like I say, we did some prototyping. We were trying to determine the, the seat height, uh, the overhangs and all that, uh, and also where the rods are supposed to be. So those are not very evident in, in the process that I showed just now. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, we have time for maybe one last question. Uh, any question from the floor? Okay, from one way, I understand that there are computational design and beam training content for the students. Are there any modular programs that the existing workforce could engage and benefit from? Yes, I think SP has, right? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah we do. Because uh, we do have long courses, which me and Aloysius are teaching some of the modules. Um, and short courses, I think is in the works. That's why I heard. Yeah, but um, content wise, I'm not too sure, but uh, I guess uh, Pong, you can ask Chris. I think he'll be more familiar. Timeline, um, I'm not the best person to advise you on that though. <laughs> oh, but maybe, you know who maybe. to ask, right? Yeah. We can share also when we post the video uh, for, yeah. for this particular sharing session. Um, so SP definitely has, um, BCA Academy also has, and it's also modular based. Um, so they have like a long course where you will get a specialist diploma. They, they also have um, bite-sized modules, which are not that long. Um, the diploma, I think, stretches up to a year. There's bite-sized modules that are maybe one quarter or two quarters. So uh, those who are interested, please feel free to watch out when we post the uh, video here later on. We will add it as a link. Um, I'm also going I'm also adding this link. This is the YouTube channel that we have uh, under the auspices of uh, BCA. Uh, so it's called Practice Beam. So we always upload the videos of our past sharing sessions um, and yes, if we, we will we will add, we will put in all this information into the new one. Okay. Okay. I think that's 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 good for today. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we will have our session again next month. And thank you so much, Dr. Chu, for joining us. And thank you, Yi Peng, for having your presentation. So it's good right now you present to the public. Have more confidence for future. 
So I'm very happy that to, today we are sharing with all the students, uh, I mean, works from Singapore Poly and Niam Poly. I think it's a very, very good direction in which the Poly students are gaining such good skills that they can bring to the workforce once they graduate. So thank you so much, everybody, and I hope to see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Aloysius. Okay. Thank you, Aloysius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.